Okay, well, good evening. My name is, is Richard Young. I'm hoping the technology will work for us. I think the microphone's mainly for live streaming. I'm, I'm hoping you can hear me from the back. Uh, just a little bit about myself, Richard Young. I'm a child of civil engineer. What's a child of civil engineer? Uh, I build stuff, um, and I've been doing that for the last 35, 40 years, pretty much all the way around the world. Um, I used to work for Waka Katahi, so um, I was responsible for the Waka, or large parts of the Waikato Expressway, so I know a little bit about what I'm talking about, not much. Um, but what I do know is, is how to look at information and try and make sense of it and try and answer some of the valid questions and so try and find a way forward and find some practical solutions. I've got 15 minutes now. That was my first minute. I was allowed a minute for an introduction. Uh, liberating a lane on the Auckland Harbour Bridge for walking and cycling, or as I prefer to call it, Trevor's Big Day Out. So um, let me take you back to 1974 on a very wet day in 1974 and introduce you to Trevor. This is Trevor and uh, Trevor's daughter's Rally 20, three-speed bike, and um, Trevor's friends. Uh, effectively, there was a bus strike and um, the, the good people of responsible for the bridge said, well, let's let people walk and cycle across it. And they did. And it happened. And Trevor is my hero. So we'll keep Trevor in the corner because we, we really want to understand what, what Trevor's got to do with all this. Um, but there are lots and lots of reasons not to liberate a lane. The traffic volumes are too high. Uh, the peaks are back to pre-COVID. There's not enough room on the bridge. The path wouldn't be wide enough. The bridge is too steep. You can't protect people from cars. People might jump off. It may be too windy. There we go. The bridge sways. That's a good one. Um, and emergency services, they can't get to the bridge and you can't maintain the bridge. Um, it, look, I don't do a lot of audience participation, but if you've read my 124-page report, can you just wave at me now? Two people. That's really impressive. Thank you. Do you want to come and do this? <laughs> So the, the good news is, is rather than having to read 124 pages, in 14 minutes or 13 and a half minutes, I'll take you through pretty much what the report says. So look, the, the Bridge 101, you're more familiar with this than I am. Currently it runs five plus three. So in the morning, five lanes in, three lanes out. In the evening, five lanes out, three lanes in. Um, and they move it during the day. We're proposing, under this arrangement, to take one lane. So there's always four lanes for peak flow and three lanes in the opposite direction. Uh, technically, if you wanted to run five lanes out of the city, you still can, but that's, that's for emergencies. So effectively, one lane for walking and cycling on the eastern side. Now, I'm going to sit down for this because I keep needing the mouse to, to, to go through. Look, I'm an engineer, so I've looked at the last 10 years of traffic data. It's what I do. Um, every 15 minutes and try to work out how much traffic's going across. And Waka Katahi have been brilliant. They do provide all this information. So this is 1 February in 2016. It's a Monday between 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning and 29,425 vehicles headed into the city. I'm not going to do every single day. I'm going to sort of summarise it from here. So I said, well, that was when five lanes were open. What if only four lanes were open? And the answer is there wouldn't have been enough room for 943 cars or vehicles at the time, at the time they, they chose to come across. Um, but what you can see is anything below that red line is spare space, spare capacity, unused capacity. So, okay, we couldn't have gone, got away with four lanes on that day because the, the red is bigger than the, the gap. So we run it across a week. And effectively what I've done is we've looked at every day for the last 10 years um, and worked out if there was only four lanes of traffic, how much traffic would struggle to get across. 2016, about a thousand vehicles each morning. I'm gonna skip forward, I've got a whole load of animations, but I'm just gonna go forward to 2022. So this was last year. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, so Monday to Friday, 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock in the morning, um, you can see a really peaky thing. What that means is the people in North Shore are staying in bed longer, and then they're all trying to get across the bridge at 7.30 in the morning. That was last year. 
That's this year, February. Um, not quite many people are staying in bed quite so long, but they're not all trying to get across at the same time. So what this is, look, in layman's terms saying is, when there is no red, there is capacity for that whole rush hour, that whole peak period that there's space on the bridge. Any white below the dotted red line is unused capacity. There is space on the bridge. So when people say the bridge is full, uh, actually the bridge isn't full. Um, there is a significant amount of unused capacity. And what we're seeing is when it's busy, people get up a bit earlier, go a bit later. So what I've shown you there is effectively 15 days out of the last 10 years. What I'll just pull up here is this is the average capacity of traffic on the bridge, the amount of traffic on the bridge. This is in the evening going north. Anything above that red line is more than four lanes can carry. Anything below the red line, there is spare capacity. Two things to note, obviously at the moment, you know, 2021, 20, 22, 23, we are significantly below the capacity of four lanes. Waka Katahi is currently providing five lanes. But what this is showing that for an evening peak period, four lanes is actually adequate. It's from 2016, it's been slowly dropping. This isn't COVID related. The number of vehicles crossing the bridge at peak times has been reducing steadily, but surely from 2016, every quarter it's been going down. Prime reason is it's those big blue things that everyone jumps on at the park and rides. The number of people crossing into Auckland on buses now exceeds the number of people going across vehicles. So the bridge has got spare capacity. It's been going down since 2016 and it has not returned to pre-COVID levels. So that's one of the first takeaways because there has been statements that do not correlate with what the data shows. So we've done the traffic. That's all I'm going to say about traffic volumes. Uh, there's 100, of 124 pages, about 85 pages to do with traffic volumes because I like traffic. Um, so we'll get on to the other stuff, which is to do with, well, uh, how are you going to make this thing fit? There's a drawing of the bridge. That's actually not my drawing. That's what Katahi's drawing. This is actually one of the options that they considered was a four meter wide cycle lane, shared lane. So no surprise, the design I came up with is also four meters wide. It is effectively their design. Um, there's a few subtle changes, um, but what that four meter width shows is that the projected volumes of usage from Wakatahi is just under a thousand a day. I think that's probably a bit on the low side. That path, that gradient will take about 800 people an hour quite safely in a tidal flow situation. Um, and there's a there's an organisation called Osroads, and they design things and they they make guidance and we've checked it all to that, and the cycleway, the shared path would would meet that criteria, so it is possible to do within just one lane of the bridge. And again, it's been said that two lanes have been needed. We can't find the evidence for that. It's too steep. When the report came out, I had News Talk ZB on the phone within about 20 minutes, and the only question they said is. The bridge is really steep. And I said, if you stand at one end and look at it, yes, it looks really steep, but if you, you know, uh, it's 5%, that's one in 20. If you cycle, you realize that 5%, one in 20 is not steep. Um, the Osroads, the guides don't even classify it as, as, as steep. Apparently, I wasn't there, children rode over it. We know that Tr Trevor rode over it, there's Trevor. Um, and similarly, Wakatahi are actually proposing one of the schemes when they eventually deliver the second crossing to repurpose part of the existing bridge for walking and cycling. So suddenly they realize it's not quite as steep as they thought it was. It's also not as steep compared to other paths and I'll show you a little graphic just now. And then there was a concern and I'm not making this up that one of the biggest risks for not converting to walking and cycling was a significant number of cyclists will be doing in excess of 60 kilometers an hour and hitting people coming the other direction. Um, I don't think that's credible. What I did do was look at the gradient of the Auckland Harbour Bridge path compared to four other paths that Wakatai either built or are building. And what we can see here is that Auckland Harbour Bridge, 900 metres long, rise of about 45 metres. It's not insignificant when you compare it to some of the other ones that are either built or, or inbuilt. 
Um, it's one of the smaller ones. Um, probably the most common one to compare it to is Grafton Gully. It's actually a little bit longer. Um, Harbour Bridge is a little bit longer and about the same rise as Grafton Gully. So I think in your cycle Grafton Gully, you know there's a couple of steep bits. They will be steeper than the Auckland Harbour Bridge. Uh, protection of people from vehicles. If you're only converting one lane, uh, you do need to have a barrier between the people and the vehicles. Um, this particular barrier here, it's approved by Wakatahi. It's freestanding, it sits on the bridge. Um, and because you've only got one lane of traffic, yeah, the, any trucks or any vehicles can't really get a big angle to hit it with. <clears throat> so even a full bus at 80 kilometers an hour, this barrier will move less than a metre, probably less than half a metre. In reality, people don't walk right against the barrier, they walk a bit in. It's a relatively safe solution. Also remember that on almost every other 80 kilometre road in New Zealand, pedestrians and cyclists have no protection whatsoever. So this is actually far safer than almost any other road in New Zealand. Just for information, this is the same presentation that we were uh, gave to Akatahi last week. Anti-climb provision, uh, deterrent from uh, people climbing up on over the bridge. Uh, we do know in international research is that if you provide barriers, significant barriers, you can reduce that by 50%. Uh, I'm a Brit, although I've got a Kiwi passport, so I'm really a Kiwi. Um, Clifton Suspension Bridge, which is twice as high and 10 times older than the, the bridge we have here, uh, they have got these barriers here uh, and they are effective. They're also effective with trained staff, <coughs> CCTV and other provisions. And significantly, they do provide a view. Um, so there is a solution that we can provide to deter people from climbing on the side of the road and also to put a, a mesh up on the, the side where the barrier will be just to stop things from vehicles um, in, um, coming onto the, the walkway. So it is possible to do, it is achievable to do. Wind. Apparently it gets windy. Um, uh, look. <laughs> Most of the wind is from the west. Uh, the little asterisks are the OIAs. I've actually lost count of the number of OIAs we've put in on this. I think it's around 30 or 40. Um, as you all know, most of the wind is from the west. Actually, 83% of the wind is from the west, the strong wind. So we're going to put the cycleway path on the eastern side. It gives them passive protection. Not perfect. Uh, it's not possible to put wind deflectors in because of the strength of the bridge. Um, and similarly, Unexpected gusts, which is one of the another main reasons why Wakatahi are very concerned about walking cycling on the bridge, was basically they said, look, gusts can occur at any time in any direction without any warning. Their data does not support that statement. Their data shows that almost all the gusts of winds are in the same direction as the prevailing wind. So we do know there are risks. You know, we've seen the uh, potential closures in the last few days. Yes, their main concern is vehicles falling over and damaging the bridge. It is a, okay, a venerable structure. You know, it's, it's a few years old now, so they do want to protect it. Um, but from that perspective, um, the path could remain open at wind speeds of up to 75, which I think is what they've been getting over the last few days. Yes, it will close. It can be closed. Um, wind socks, really cheap, really effective at giving regular users, whether on foot, on bike, or in cars, a really good indication of what's going to happen to them in the next two kilometres. Um, people can make informed decisions. People on walking and cycling are much closer. They make a decision when they see the bridge. If you're 20 kilometres back and doing 100 kilometres an hour, yes, you might need to be managed more. So again, it's finding the right solution, providing the right information so people can make those informed decisions. And we are talking about having permanent trained staff always present on the bridge for lots of reasons. The sway issue. <clears throat> uh, uh, second piece of audience participation. Who's seen the video? This is a video, there's, there's three videos now. Uh, basically, whenever there is a large, how do we call it? Let's call it, like okay, a protest mask going across the bridge and it takes up two lanes. Not intentionally, people seem to do walk in step and the bridge moves. We're talking hundreds of people, if not thousands of people. And it's not one bridge up there, it's three bridges, one in the middle and one on either side. And they are two gaps, one either side. 
and those gaps open and close when you get thousands of people walking on the clip-ons. It's a known fact, um, but it does cause a significant hazard because there is a gap that opens and closes and you don't want to put anything in it. There is a solution. Uh, Wakatahi designed the solution 12 years ago, but haven't implemented as yet. Our proposal is for a single lane, which is obviously remote from where the gap is. And similarly, the forecast usage, whether it's the cons very conservative Wakatahi figures or perhaps more realistic figures of usage of pedestrians, and it is only pedestrians that cause it, cyclists, runners, scooters, don't generate this sideways sway. The number of pedestrians on there it's implausible that you get enough people on there on a single lane to generate this sway. Having said that, yeah, we think the sway probably is something that Wakatai really need to have a look at and get resolved. So last couple of slides, maintenance and control. I'll just whiz through that. Um, yes, it needs to be maintained. We need gates on it. it needs to be CCTV, it needs to be a PA system. It needs to be routine maintenance. Walking across at the moment, they have to put a lane closure on. It costs thousands, there's risk associated with it. For a lot of maintenance, they can actually literally just walk to where they need to get to. Maintenance, closures, and who doesn't like toys? How about one of these you know, double-ended little trucks to, to wheel backs and forwards across the bridge? Or e-bikes, there are solutions. So that's the maintenance side, and then from the, the emergency side, um, they already deal with crashes and breakdowns, so they have solutions for that. Train bridge staff, this is that photo is actually a guy in Sydney. Um, where they have trained staff for first responders, counsellors, also visible reassurance and enforcement for those cyclists that might be tempted to go anything more than 30 kilometres an hour. Also public ambassadors for the bridge. If you talk to the, the guys on Sydney Harbour Bridge, the, the, the knowledge they have of everything is phenomenal. Ambassadors. So you've got the CCTV, the path wide enough to get fire trucks through, uh, and then you know, certain... Um, special vehicles as required. So these are a lot of the, um, the challenges that have been raised about why we can't do walking and cycling on the bridge. I've had 13 minutes, that's 11 of them. That's pretty much what I've told you. Um, some of them are more challenging. As an engineer, this is not a perfect solution. The problem is, is that perfect solutions are quite often means you don't get good solutions. So what I've tried to find is a pragmatic, realistic way uh, that we can deliver this um, relatively quickly, certainly within a year, uh, and it could be done. So here's Trevor. I really hope Trevor will have his big day out, and um, we shall wait and see what happens. I know there's going to be time for questions and discussion later on, so I'll pass back. <laughs>